Hey everybody and welcome back to See Elise. Today you're gonna see Elise clean and crime. If you're new here, my name is Elise and I love to listen to true crime while I clean my house and do my chores and I know I'm not alone here. Every week I post a new motivating cleaning video while at the same time I sit in a little bubble and I tell you a true crime story that's interesting to me. So if you love true crime and you also love cleaning, you should subscribe because I post a new episode of Cleaning and Crime every Saturday. Today's true crime case is the story of Omaima Ari Nelson. Oh boy. And since Thanksgiving is right around the corner, I thought this would be a great story to cover. Do you know this story? Oh shit. Some call her the Thanksgiving Butcher. Some call her a female Dahmer. Some believe that Omaima was a cannibal. Blanket trigger warning here, you guys. <laughs> this is the most gruesome case I have ever covered on Cleaning and Crime. Today there will be discussions of sexual assault, childhood abuse, domestic violence, dismemberment, decapitation, disemboweling, castration, and cannibalism. And body parts. Like, if this doesn't sound like something that you're interested in hearing about, then maybe go back and watch some of my older Cleaning and Crime episodes. I have a playlist on my channel and go ahead and skip this one because this one is a doozy. Omaima was born in 1968 in Egypt near the Sudanese border in a small, poor farming village. Omaima had a really rough upbringing. Her father was physically and sexually abusive from a young age, both to her and to her mother. And at seven years old, Omaima was subjected to female circumcision. Now, if you are unfamiliar with the practice of female circumcision, it is fucking terrible and awful and disgusting and the worst. It involves the mutilation and often slicing of external female genitalia with the intention of making sex unpleasurable and often painful. Some carry out the practice to control women and to keep them from wanting to be promiscuous, which is so fucked. Oh no, we can't have women enjoying themselves ever. Omaima unfortunately suffered the most severe version of female circumcision, which involves complete removal of the most fun of external lady parts, which is absolutely horrific. And it obviously left Omaima with permanent scarring and sex was for the rest of her life unpleasurable and incredibly painful. Omaima's mother was eventually able to take Omaima and get away from the abusive father, which is great. But with no real means to support them, they ended up settling in a slum in Cairo, Egypt, known as the City of the Dead. Which is called that because it's literally shacks built around the tombs. So, not the best place to grow up, you know? In 1986, Omaima's 18, and she met an American oil worker who was in Egypt for work. Now, Omaima, let's be real. She had the looks, okay? She had the cheekbones. She had the body. She was petite. She was thin. She had curves. She was hot, okay? She was hot. She quickly got the attention of the rich American oil worker, and right away they started a romantic and sexual relationship. And when Omaima's mother got wind of the relationship between Omaima and the rich oil worker, she was very concerned that no one in Egypt, no Muslim would marry her because she was no longer a virgin. I guess um, the sexual assault by her father doesn't count, but I don't know, whatever. So she convinces Omaima, you need to get this guy to marry you because if you don't marry him, it's over for you, you're washed up. So Omaima, she gets the job done. She's like, please take me away from this awful place and bring me to Texas. And so he does. He marries Omaima and takes his new 18-year-old Egyptian bride back to Texas with him when his job in Egypt is over. However, this marriage predictably did not last and they broke up almost immediately upon arriving in Texas. So this leaves an 18-year-old Omaima alone in a foreign city, in a foreign country, not really speaking that much English and not really having any formal education either. So she began taking babysitting jobs, housekeeping jobs, nanny jobs, and with her hotness, she managed to secure some part-time modeling gigs. She also turned to petty crime. She had some arrests for petty theft and shoplifting and things like that, but mostly her energy went into dating a lot. She was kind of like a small time sugar baby, but she wasn't going after these like big rich millionaire sugar daddies trying to get a bunch of money. She was just trying to get a roof over her head. Sugar baby for survival, you know? She would date a new guy right away, move in with him, and then she would spend his money freely and and then if she got called out or kicked out, she would rob them for whatever she could get and then peace out and move on to a new boyfriend. This escalated in 1990 when Omaima was living with her boyfriend, Robert Hansen, who to be real, he was using her for sex and just letting her live there. So one day Omaima asks Robert for money and he says, well, what am I gonna get out of it? So she says, you know what? I wanna tie you up. Let's get spicy. 
So he went for it, but instead of a little fun bondage time, he ended up with a gun in his face and Omaima was demanding money. But she didn't realize that the bindings weren't as tight as she thought they were, so Robert managed to get a hand free and wrestle the gun away from Omaima and kick her out. Afterwards, with the fear of being caught for holding her boyfriend at gunpoint trying to rob him, Omaima decided it was time to leave Texas and move, so she moved to Orange County, California. Robert would later tell police that he didn't call the cops when Omaima attacked him because he was actually pretty embarrassed that that shit went down in the first place. Okay, so it's 1991. Omaima's chilling in Orange County, and she's trolling for a new sugar daddy. So it's October in 91, and she's hanging out at a bar. When in walks this tall drink of water, Bill Nelson, age 56. Bill's a big man with an even bigger personality. People described him as larger than life. A big old Texas man, which apparently Omaima attracts. Bill rolls up to the bar in his red Corvette with his big gold belt buckle and his bright red cowboy boots. The people in the bar are like, oh my God, Bill! He's, you know, he's a crowd pleaser. He's flashing a lot of cash around. He's buying drinks. He's talking loudly about how much money he has, all the land and the cattle ranch that he owns in Texas. He's, you know, he's one of those. He's a boisterous, flashy type dude. And Omaima was like, what's that I hear? <laughs> Money. Now William E. Nelson, known as Bill, he was previously a pilot and he may or may not have worked for the CIA. Now that's something that the CIA would never confirm or deny. Bill was recently paroled from federal prison after his sentence for smuggling a plane full of marijuana from Mexico to the US. I don't think it's cool to partake in drug trafficking on the side if you're maybe possibly working for the CIA. <laughs> so he got caught, but he's out. He's living it up in Costa Mesa, California, living his best life, partying in the bars. And he spends his days working out of his apartment, rebuilding computers, breaking down computers, selling parts, fixing parts, that kind of techie stuff. So Omaima sees Bill and she's like, you're my next target. So she starts putting the moves on Bill and boy does it work. Sparks fly. Immediately they're dating and days later, they're engaged. Days. So to celebrate their new engagement, Bill's like, let's go on a road trip. He wanted to show off his new arm candy. So his plan was to go visit friends and family in Arkansas and then swing over to Texas to go see the cattle ranch and like meet some of his kids. While on this road trip, they ended up making a pit stop and finding a justice of the peace and getting married right there. But what Bill neglected to tell Omaima is that he was still technically married to someone else. Oops. He was going through a divorce, it just wasn't finalized yet. I guess he just thought it would all work itself out. He wasn't gonna miss out on this chance to marry a hot 23 year old Egyptian part-time model. I mean, come on. So now the road trip is a honeymoon. They make their way to Texas, meet some of Bill's kids. Now Bill is a big family. He has five kids, 17 grandkids. But Bill's kids were pretty shocked to see them roll up. A, they had never heard of this woman. They got married within days of meeting. Not to mention Bill was 56 and Omaima was 23. So he could easily have been her father, which plenty of people have age gaps in their relationships. It's not that uncommon, but I mean, the kids were like, she's younger than some of us. So it was a little awkward, but the kids were willing to give Omaima a chance. I mean, she seemed nice and they seemed to be very much in love. So Bill and Omaima and a couple of Bill's kids went horseback riding on their cattle ranch and Omaima's horse actually bucked and threw Omaima off the horse. And everybody panicked thinking she's gonna be really hurt. Everyone ran to her side and they're all like, you need to get medical attention immediately just to be, just to be safe. And Omaima declined and said, just give me an aspirin and some vodka. She threw him back, back on the horse. So then the family was like, okay, Omaima. Oh, my mother fucks, you know? She was clearly a tough lady. After the honeymoon road trip, the newlyweds headed back to Costa Mesa, California to settle into their new life in Bill's apartment. On Thanksgiving Day, 1991. And just to reiterate, they met for the first time in October, 1991. So it's only been about a month. So, Thanksgiving. Bill called his daughter Margaret on the phone to say, happy Thanksgiving, see how she's doing, give her a little update on his new life with his new wife, how he was so happy, things were going great. He told her all about this big Thanksgiving feast he was planning to celebrate his new marriage, and he actually invited Margaret to come over and join them and come meet Omaima, but Margaret declined. I think she probably thought it was a little weird and also last minute, like call someone on Thanksgiving and be like, hey, come over for Thanksgiving dinner. So either way, she declined. And unfortunately, that would be the last time Margaret ever spoke with her father. And it was the last time anyone heard from Bill Nelson. Three days later, early in the morning on December 1st, a man named Jose Esquivel was woken up by loud pounding on his door. He looked out the window and he saw a red Corvette parked on the street. And he's like, 
I don't know anybody with a Corvette. And doing exactly what I would do in this situation, he just did not answer the door. Like, I'm not expecting anybody? Absolutely not, I'm not opening the door. No, you could be trying to sell me something. It's awful. Eventually, whoever was at Jose's door did leave. But several hours later, at 1 p.m., the person in the red Corvette came back. And this time, Jose caught a glimpse out the window and he was like, oh, Mima? Now, about a year ago, Jose and Omaima had gone out a couple of times, but they stopped seeing each other and Jose heard that Omaima had moved on and married some guy named Bill. So he was like, it's pretty weird to have an ex-girlfriend show up a year later out of nowhere. So he opens the door, he's like, Omaima, what's going on? Immediately he notices that she's very distraught. She's been crying. She's got cuts and blood all over her. Now, Omaima, as soon as she walks in, launches into this dramatic tale about how she's just gotten married a few weeks ago to this guy named Bill, and he is abusive, he's a violent and dangerous man, and that he tied her up and held her hostage this entire weekend and sexually assaulted her for days. Now, she told Jose that she managed to get one hand free of her bindings, and she grabbed a lamp, and she hit Bill. And she hit him hard. And he died. She had just killed her husband. But it was self-defense. Jose was like, holy shit, I mean, that's an awful story. I just don't know why you're telling me. What are you doing here? Why don't you go to the cops? So Omaima says, look, well, look, I don't need much. I just need help. I, I actually already cut him up. So I just need someone with a truck to help me load up the body parts and help me dispose of the body. You need what now? Oh, but I can pay. Bill has $75,000 in his safe and two motorcycles in the garage. And if you help me, you can have it all. So Jose is like, Okay, okay, I'll help you. I don't have my truck here, so why don't you wait here? I'll go get my truck. I'll meet you back here and we'll go together to Bill's and I will help you. Oh, mom is like tight, awesome, thank you. So she sits and waits in the Corvette while Jose leaves to go pick up his truck. But instead of going to pick up his truck, he went straight to the nearest payphone and called the police. Good boy. You love it. You love to hear it in a true crime story when someone does the right thing thing. I had to go in there, didn't I? So Jose told the police everything, every detail that Omaima said. So police head straight to Jose's apartment and Omaima's just sitting there waiting in her Corvette, still waiting for Jose. Beautiful. So police officers converge on the Corvette and they start questioning Omaima. Immediately they can see that she's in distress. She's got blood cuts on her. She's been crying. They're trying to ask her questions and she seems like she's being cooperative, but her answers don't make much sense. Like she starts saying she just was sexually assaulted all weekend. She got away from her abusive husband. But then as she's questioned more, she's saying, well, my husband's out of town. I can't reach him. He's in Florida on a business trip. So she seems confused. She's not making sense. So police decide to get her out of the car and search the vehicle. So as soon as an officer starts searching the vehicle, he notices a garbage bag on the passenger seat. And he does one of these things where you lift it up and, ugh. Oh no. When he lifts up that garbage bag and looks inside, it looks like organs. It looks like organs. He's like, okay, everyone fucking stop. Don't touch anything. Okay, so buckle in people. This is where we get into the Dahmer level nastiness. It's it's gonna be gross and awful from he, for, for a good while now. So they call down an investigator from the coroner's office. And as soon as he gets there and looks, he's like, oh yeah, those, those are lungs. Lungs? Those are lungs. Do you see the black spots right there? Yeah, that's carbon. That's from smoking. And poor Bill, he was a heavy smoker. Oh my ma. Why is there a bag of smokers lungs on the passenger seat? Jesus. Now a bag of lungs in the passenger seat of a car is, I mean, it's, wow. But oh my ma tries to explain all that. And she says, oh no, those lungs, um, Bill killed someone. Bill killed someone, it's left over from him, but he's out of town. He's in Florida on business, but Bill did that. Now, okay, lying is hard, okay? Lying is hard. I'm a terrible liar. I get like red and sweaty. Lying when you're in a really stressful situation is even harder. And lying in a foreign language has gotta be the hardest. Like, imagine trying to lie to English speaking officers when you grew up in Egypt. And you, your English is not that good, like, so yeah. They're not buying that. Anyways, it was pretty clear and pretty easy for police to get a search warrant for Bill's house. So they head straight there and they're like, we need to go in and find Bill. And they do find Bill. They find Bill 
everywhere. When they first walked into the apartment, everything looked fine. Everything looked normal. It was cluttered and kind of messy because there was boxes of computer parts everywhere because Bill took computers apart for his job. And then they see a couple of suitcases out in the middle of the room and they seemed out of place. And inside of those were garbage bags. And inside of the garbage bags appeared to be human tissue. I mean, there were lungs in the car. We saw this coming. And as they worked their way through the apartment, it just gets worse and worse. Now they go into the bedroom and they see that two of the bedposts are broken. And not in like a fun way. Not in like a Bella and Edward honeymoon fun way. And the mattress is soaked through with blood. Like all the way through, down to the box spring. That's a lot of blood. They find a broken lamp and a broken clothes iron. And both of them had human hair and human tissue on them. They found a bloody pair of scissors. The bathroom was worse. They found a torso. A whole ass torso skinned, hanging in the shower above the tub, suspended with clothes hangers to let the blood drip down the drain. Like butchers do with like a side of beef or like a freaking pig. That's some fucked up shit. But the kitchen, the kitchen, mm. officers immediately notice that there is a deep fat fryer sitting on the counter, right? And they look in and they see chunks of turkey, like white meat, turkey. Sorry, I'm laughing because it's fucking insane. And in with the turkey in the deep fat fryer, they see Bill's hands in the deep fryer, floating in the oil still. Deep fried hands. Now later it was suspected that perhaps the hands were put in the fryer to like fry off the fingerprints. I get that, I guess. Why did you throw the turkey in with it at the same time? Anyway, they find in the garbage pieces of human hip mixed with turkey and cranberry sauce. But I guess that dish did not turn out good, so that was thrown in the garbage. They also opened up the freezer and they see, you know, bags of frozen peas, frozen carrots, and then like a plate with something wrapped in tin foil. And they peel back the tin foil. And I'm like, why? Why? Don't don't peel it back. Why did you do, why'd you do that to yourselves? They peel back the tin foil and they see that inside the foil is Bill's head. <coughs> and the skin of the head was burnt, like charred. And they suspected that the head had been deep fried before the hands. What the fuck? Why were you deep frying it? Was that a failed attempt? Like, I'm gonna put it in the fryer. This isn't working, this is burning. I better wrap it in foil and put it in the freezer for later. Let's move on to the hands. I don't understand. I guess that's a good thing. That poor forensic team, holy shit, can you imagine? They all said that it was the most gruesome crime scene they had ever seen in any of their careers. And just a few months prior in July was when Jeffrey Dahmer had been caught. So that was still pretty fresh in their minds. I mean, it was nationwide news. So they were like, holy shit, we're uncovering another Dahmer over here. So anyway, the place was a horror house. So naturally they took Omaima down to the station to question her because what the fuck? Now Omaima was questioned at the police station for several hours and she did not sit down the entire time. She was pacing, she was walking all around the interrogation room. She was still acting as though Bill was alive. She would not admit that Bill was dead. Nope, I didn't kill, what are you talking about? He's not dead. She was talking in the third person. She was talking about hallucinations. She was talking about voices in her heads, like demons. Ooh. She did manage though to tell police that Bill was very abusive, he was very dangerous, very violent, that he had sexually assaulted her, but also he's out of town. He's out of town. Police are like, this interrogation is going nowhere. So they took her to the hospital to be evaluated, not only to have a rape kit done because of her sexual assault allegations, but also to document all of her wounds. Like she had wounds, cuts on her face, on her hands, on her legs, on her feet. Omaima's forensic exam showed no signs of sexual trauma at all. And it also showed that Omaima's wounds on her body were either self-inflicted or consistent with someone dismembering a body in a frenzy. Uh-oh. Meanwhile, the ME was piecing together what happened to Bill. And piecing together Bill. Can you imagine? Now, poor Bill had been decapitated, dismembered, disemboweled, castrated, and parts of him were cooked. 
The cause of death was multiple blunt force injuries to the head, and the wounds were consistent with being hit with the lamp and the clothes iron that were found at the scene that had human hair and tissue on them. Now, Bill's hands had been cut off, so they could not check his wrists for ligature marks, signs of being tied up. But ligature marks were found on Bill's ankles, proving that he had been restrained. And combined with the broken bedposts and the blood-soaked mattress, that suggested that Bill and not Omaima had been restrained on the bed. I mean, duh. And extra fucked up, the medical examiner reported that the skinning and the dismemberment of the body was really well done. It was done with incredible precision. It was professional. And the ME believed that whoever did this had probably done this before, which is concerning. But the most disturbing thing that the ME found was what the ME didn't find, which was about 80 to 100 pounds of bill. Unaccounted for. That's like half of Bill, you guys. Missing. Now, when police interviewed neighbors, one neighbor said that he heard the garbage disposal in Bill's apartment running for days. Now, he chalked it up to, it's Thanksgiving! People use their garbage disposal a lot when they cook a lot. But it was non-stop for two days, and it sounded like it was straining. Like, I'm sorry for doing that impression. That's so fucked up. But that... That's the sound that it made. And it went on for two days until finally it suddenly stopped as though it had broken. And the time frame of when the disposal sound started and when the disposal broke and stopped line up with the time of death of Bill Nelson and then when Omaima ran to Jose's house asking for help disposing of a body. Omaima was questioned further after her medical exam. It was at this point that Omaima finally started acknowledging that Bill was dead. Now she said she remembers her being attacked by Bill, her getting her arm free and hitting him with the lamp in self-defense. And then she remembers waking up surrounded by garbage bags of body parts, not knowing where she was, not knowing how she got there, not knowing what happened. She told police that she wished she remembered how she killed Bill, but after hitting him, she had no memories. Then things get weirder. Omaima starts telling police that she's a descendant of ancient Egyptians and that ancient Egyptian spirits, these women speak to her and act through her. And that right before she got an arm free during her attack, they came to her and said, he must die, he must die. And then after he was dead, these ancient Egyptian demon women told her she needed to dismember Bill because if he was dismembered, he wouldn't be able to get to the afterlife. And if she didn't cut him up, he would be in the afterlife waiting for her for afterlife revenge or something. So, okay, there's no doubt that Omaima killed Bill. So she's charged with his murder. And as the trial approaches, Omaima is working closely with a court-appointed psychiatrist to evaluate her mental state, obviously. Omaima told her all about her past, about her childhood abuse, about her past traumas, which, which are very real. And she was diagnosed with PTSD from all of her past traumas. Her psychiatrist described Omaima as very soft-spoken, very sad, almost always tearful. Omaima described her short relationship with Bill to the psychiatrist. She described Bill as a very dangerous and violent man. She talked about his federal prison time Time, his drug trafficking. She said Bill was physically and sexually abusive during the entirety of their very short marriage. And the biggest bombshell that Omaima dropped while she was meeting with the psychiatrist is when she was pushed and questioned about the dismemberment to see what she remembered. Omaima told her psychiatrist that she had taken some of Bill's ribs and she had covered them in barbecue sauce and cooked them in the oven, like in a restaurant. And when she tried them, she was surprised that he was so sweet and said nothing was sweeter. Oh, Mima, I don't know. Maybe she didn't eat any of him, but they did not find his ribs. I will tell you that at trial. Everyone knows Omaima did it. That's not the question here. The question was, was she having a psychotic break? Was she all there when she killed him? Was it self-defense? Was she all there? when she dismembered him. So the jury needed to decide if it was first degree murder, second degree murder, or manslaughter. There was also an additional charge of assault on Omaima's ex-boyfriend, Robert Hansen, because when police went back and dug into Omaima's past to see if 
maybe she had dismembered any other boyfriends, they found Robert Hansen. And he told police the whole story about when Omaima had tied him up and held him at gunpoint. And, and speaking of the ex-boyfriend, so I have to tell this because I think it's relevant. When they were digging into Omaima's past, they also dug into her criminal record. And remember how I said she had been arrested a few times for like petty theft? Well, back in Texas, Omaima had been caught shoplifting and when the female security guard approached her and confronted Omaima, she turned vicious and violent and she bit the female security guard on the breast and took a chunk out of it. Then she grabbed her by the crotch and dropped her and then ran. Now they did find her, but holy shit, Omaima. As soon as I heard that, I was like, cannibal, cannibal. I believed that rib story so fast. I was like, you, you tried to eat a booby. I guarantee you took a bite of those ribs at least. Like, that's just my opinion, but holy shit, Omaima. So anyway, back to the trial. Defense put Omaima on the stand. She told the jury all about the abuse that she suffered, basically everything that she told her psychiatrist. She told the jury that after her and Bill got married, Bill would demand oral sex multiple times a day. She said that on their honeymoon road trip, Bill told her that if she didn't do what he wanted her to do, he would kill her. And she also said that Bill threw a small kitten that Omaima had found out of the car window. Now this is all just Omaima telling us her side of the story, but we have no way of knowing if any of that is true. And Bill wasn't there to testify, he wasn't there to stand up for himself, so we'll never know. But that was the statement Omaima gave on the stand. She also denied having ever eaten any of Bill. So that was the only part that she backtracked on, but you all know my opinion. So Omaima's final version of events on the stand was that on Thanksgiving weekend, Bill had restrained her and sexually assaulted her over the entire weekend. She had managed to get a hand free, hit him with the lamp. Then she grabbed a clothes iron and hit him in the head with that until the handle broke. Then she found a pair of scissors and began stabbing him. She did it all to save her own life. And she said if she hadn't done it, she would have died that day. She also told the jury that she had no memory of dismembering him. Prosecution showed home videos and photos of the couple on their honeymoon road trip, and it showed a young couple in love, laughing and giggling and smiling for the camera. And they basically used that and said, does this look like a violent, dangerous man to you? And they also showed their evidence that showed Bill was the one tied up on the bed and not Omaima. They also put Omaima's ex-boyfriend Robert Hansen on the stand to show that that was her MO. She ties up dudes and robs them. Now the jury deliberated for almost a week and on January 12th, 1993, they came back with a guilty verdict for second degree murder. And Omaima was sentenced to 28 years to life in prison. She was denied parole in 2006 because the parole board thought that she was unpredictable and a threat to public safety. And then she was denied again in 2011 because she had not taken responsibility for the murders and that she wouldn't be a productive member of society if she was freed. Now, despite being behind bars, Omaima managed to get herself a new sugar daddy. That's right. We don't know how they met, but Omaima formed a relationship with an older man. He was in his 70s and they were able to get married while she was in prison and they were given several conjugal visits. And when he died, he left Omaima a whole bunch of money. Even behind bars, she was doing it. She was getting it done. So if Omaima ever gets out of prison, she'll have a nice cushion waiting for her in her savings account. And men are stupid. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but seriously, man, her, she's your dream girl, really? You're gonna leave all your money to, okay, okay, cool. Omaima will be eligible for parole again in 2026, so we'll see what happens. That is the story of Omaima Ari Nelson, the Thanksgiving butcher, and I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think she was a cannibal? I don't know what I think. I mean, but she said she tried his ribs, and why? Why would you even ever say that if you hadn't done it? You know? Sicko. And you know what else is weird? When you Google her, <laughs> she comes up as Egyptian model, not convicted murderer and possible cannibal. <laughs> Men are stupid. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you maybe enjoyed this video. I'm sorry that was a little dark, but I hadn't done a dark story yet and I wanted to try it out, see how you guys like it. Leave me a comment down below, let me know what you thought. And also let me know in the comments if there's a case that you'd like me to cover. If you liked the video, give me a like and don't forget to subscribe because I will be back next week with another episode of Cleaning and Crime.
Thanks again for watching. Bye!